Thank you everyone for being here, especially the women, but this is not work, this is fun. So um, this is only day one of some very, very packed days, so I hope you're getting strapped for the ride. Um, we have a great series of talks lined up um, throughout the course of the next two days. So I'm on the GEO team within Google, and we're really excited to share our journey with you um, as we went out to explore the world. And um, I'd also like to sort of make very clear to you that we think this is the time, this is the era for location intelligence. And I'm going to take you through this, through the conversation, through our conversation. I hope it is a, you feel this is a conversation over the next hour um, to really explain our journey as well as how we think about the future. So, as you know, Google's mission is a bold one. It's to organize the world's information. And as part of the mission, very early on, it became clear to us that we really had to understand the real world and not just focus on online experiences. So as part of this obsession about really trying to understand the real world, we built three user experiences to help our users get this access to this great knowledge that we were building. These three experiences I think you are all familiar with. The first one is Maps, our Google Maps, which is probably how many of you found your way to the Moscone today. Local search, Google is a search company, and local search essentially is when you ask Google, not just about what's on the internet, but what's around you. And finally, Google Earth, where you can see the planet, this wonderful planet that we live in, without leaving your seat. We've had some really big, bold, world-scale successes in these three applications. On Google Maps, at this point, we have about a billion users using our products daily, in many cases. And we've taken the product from a directions and navigation product to a lot more. Those of you who use Google Maps today um, will see notifications um, when, you, when there is an anticipated traffic delay for your daily commute. Or you might even choose to use Google Maps to get a ride. On the search side, what you may not know is six out of 10 searches on Google are actually local in nature. So this is when users are asking for, say, if they type a query um, sushi, they're not expecting a link to a Wikipedia page about sushi or even the definition of sushi. They want to know where to get great sushi. Both these products, Google Maps and our local search, are powered by what we term location intelligence. Now, I'll explain to you what that means, and I'm going to share some examples of customers and partners who use location intelligence to really drive their businesses and build amazing consumer experiences. And I hope through the course of this discussion and after, you get some really great ideas on how you could use location intelligence to power your business and create the kinds of user experiences you've seen Google produce. So let me take you a little bit back, a trip down memory lane. Um, and I'm not talking that long ago, just a decade ago, which doesn't feel very long to me anymore, um, when my family would go out to explore go to a, a place that was not familiar. Before we embarked on the trip, the first thing my husband did was take another trip. And this time it was to the AAA. And he'd go to the AAA and get those little triptychs and those paper maps, and we'd stick it in the car. And that's how we went out and embarked on our explorations. Around that same time, so we're talking about a decade ago, it was actually a little bit longer, 11 years ago, Google set our, out to do something really audacious with Google Maps. We decided we wanted to go and digitize the map for the world. So we'd have to leave paper behind and actually create a digital version of the map. But we didn't just do this for 
one location or even a country. Our goal was a lot more ambitious. We wanted to map the entire world. Every street, every surface, every business, all of it. And since then, as you've seen, we've not only brought maps online all around the world, but we've also created these really beautiful, rich experiences where you can experience the corners of the planet from the tops of the highest mountains to the oceans, as I said, without leaving your seat or even, in this case, learning how to dive. And because increasingly we saw that this world was becoming mobile and connected, we brought these experiences to mobile. Essentially what we ended up giving all the users in the world with a phone was a handy guide to the real world. And this could help them then get to where they were going, provide the best experience when they arrived, and even provide interesting ideas for detours along the way. Now, that sounds so great. And 11 years later, we're very proud of where we've come. But this was not easy. We hit several walls. These were big hurdles that we had to climb over the years. Because what we were trying to do was something that was a one of a kind. It had never been done before, and certainly not at the scale that we were aspiring for. So when we hit some serious technology hurdles, what did we do? We're a company of engineers. And what do engineers do when they find that there is a technological um, hurdle? They build new technology. That's how they solve it, they fix it. So essentially what we did over the course of our journey as we were scaling was we built new infrastructure that would help us get to the scale that we were aspiring to. And we also found new ways and rethought the ways we would develop our products. Google Cloud and machine learning, that these two very powerful pairs, along with Google Maps, changed our business. And that's what we call, within Google, location intelligence. Now, location intelligence gave us, within Google, the scale, the power, and the infrastructure to help us with our dreams of knowing everything about the real world. And now what we feel really excited about are the possibilities of bringing this to your world. What powered maps and local search and, and Earth can be used for enterprise use cases as well. But we, I want to go further than that. I mean, it's great, but we, we don't think location intelligence is just an imperative. We actually think it's a force multiplier in this mobile connected world. So what does that mean, a force multiplier? In this case, it means that every service that you're building could be improved with location intelligence. You could elevate your offering and in a way that could be disruptive, disruptive to your business, disruptive to the ecosystem, and build solutions that have location-based insights and can be delivered at scale and in real time. Now, I'll share with you a few examples of how enterprises have used the rich data of Google Maps the scale of cloud, and the power of machine learning to grow their businesses, because it's already happening today. So let me start with Google Maps API. This is one of our older products. We launched this around the same time as we launched our consumer Google Maps product. And over the years, as we continue to iterate and improve our consumer product, we continue to augment our Maps API. I think several of you in this room are probably familiar with this. This is almost a decade old and constantly advancing. So we see four main use cases in how customers and partners use our Maps API. Display, go, locate, and explore. So what's display? Display is simple. It's about, it's when you want to put a map on your app or website. Go helps users navigate around the world. Locate is a use case for tracking users or assets around the world. 
And finally, explore is this really rich knowledge of places and businesses around the world that Google has captured that we make available to you through our Places API. So let's start with display. As I said, this is sort of at the core of maps. This is when we use our visual map and provide this to you. So you can build custom maps that can be personalized for your use cases and for the needs of your users. Now, here's a great example of a customer who's used Google Maps, the visualization API, to build a really great experience. So they created a tool called Good Home, um, which essentially, because they're in the insurance business, they really needed to find a way to give their users the ability to get personalized quotes so they could sort of start the process of converting them from users on a website to customers. And so with Good Home, what they did was they created a personalized experience that was personalized for your locale, for where you were. So incorporating risks, so for example, in a given neighborhood, what the crime rate was in that neighborhood, or in a region that is swampy, what the, the risk of flooding is, or if you're around here, the risk of the, the big one hitting you. So what they found, and this was really impressive, they found that with this localized, personalized experience, users were 350% more likely to ask for a quote and then get to conversion. And what is also pretty awesome is they were able to go from concept, from thinking about this uh, as a design phase, to completing and launching the site in under 90 days. So this is really powerful because ultimately, the technology that we were providing really came to a place where a customer at the end of the day was able to get a better experience. Let's take the, other, the next use case, navigation. What we found is over the years, customers have used our advanced navigation capabilities to really transform businesses. And as you're seeing, I think, in recent years, disrupt um, whole industries. A great example of this is Lyft. Um, they're a great customer, and they use our real-time location data to connect drivers and riders. If e any of you have used a Lyft, um, Lyft or an Uber, I think you'll see that that whole experience around right from when you find where your driver is as he's coming to you, through your ride experience, and as well as the driver as he is making his way to get you to your destination, all that is powered through our Maps navigation APIs. And what really has happened over the last very few years, actually, is this technology has actually created an entirely new business category, something that we didn't, didn't exist a few years ago. And they've had some phenomenal successes in the case of Lyft. There were 2 million Lyft ride shares monthly with 100,000 drivers on payroll in 200 cities. So I came in a lift today to the Moscone. Previously, I'd come to San Francisco and I'd worry about parking, and all I do now is book a ride, and I'm here. So what's really interesting about this use case is, if you think about it, Google set out to understand how the world moved and, and how users moved around the world. And essentially, now what our customers have done is they've used our technology and our products to change the way users move. So I think that's really cool. The third use case is closely tied to navigation, but this is really around tracking of vehicles, people, assets, even connected devices with IoT around the world. Now, location tracking makes supply chains very efficient and logistics a lot more comp competitive in this new world where it is about on-demand, real-time delivery. These are now table stakes. And here's a customer that's built something that's really cool using our APIs. So DPD is a customer that uses our live tracking, our basically our location APIs, to deliver 3.6 million parcels daily. And as they moved to our APIs, what they were able to do was to introduce live tracking of those parcels. So in this case, what you can do with DPD is the sender and the recipient can both look at the exact position of a package through its transit, following the journey on a map. And the arrival ETA is within 30 minutes of the projected delivery time. 
Now, a few years ago, if you remember, we kind of, we'd know we'd get this on a Thursday, maybe, and sometimes a package would come in on a Friday instead. And here we are now, tracking these things in real time, expecting to track them in real time. And even in my case, because I travel a lot, um, from time to time, I'll redirect the packages when I know that I'm not going to be home. This transparency, this control, this level of service that was just not possible before, our table stakes now. Customers demand it. And the technology that we've provided that our customers are now using essentially make this possible. And finally, the last use case is around Explore. Now, everyone uses Google, Google's local search. And what we really thought was really important to do was to provide, because we know that ultimately there are users who come to your products and your services that don't come to Google's local search, not always, that we wanted to make sure that you had access to the same rich knowledge of places around the world through our Maps APIs. So here is an example of a customer that's done exactly that. The travel aggregator site called Tripping, what they do is they use our Maps API for places to get address listings and destination information for their rental properties. So what they do is they take the location information from each listing that they have, and they drop it on a map. And because of the way we made this work, it automatically scales the map to match your query. So for example, if you're searching for rentals in Paris, <laughs> it'll map it to the correct zoom level. And if you decide you want to get a little bit more local and you want to look at neighborhoods around the Eiffel Tower, I don't know why you would, because it's really crowded around there. But if you did, you'd get to that tighter zoom almost immediately without, any, you know, without, without users having to pinch and pan and zoom. So it's, just, it's all beautifully integrated in the consumer experience. The other thing that Tripping in particular found really useful was just having accurate address data. So what they found was that their rental, their rental property owners didn't always provide the full address, uh, making it really hard for um, potential buyers, uh, rental renters to, to get to the place. But that was not a problem anymore, because with Google's Maps API, essentially, and because of our knowledge of the addresses around the world, we could complete it for you, essentially. So if we see an address that's not complete, we can match it with the address in our records essentially fill in the blanks. So what's really awesome about this case was the numbers. When I first saw this slide, I thought it was 200% increase, which seemed really awesome. But this was closer to 2,400%. And they got 2 million users very quickly after they launched this new site. Now, this is not a big company. You probably have not all heard of Tripping, the way you may have heard of Lyft. But as a result of this, they were able to recently close a Series B round and get more venture funding. And I say this because it's examples like this that get us really excited within Google, because we're starting to see the birth of these new companies that are able to use technology to drive these really great user experiences and create new businesses. for our customers that use our tools and provide great experiences. Now, this is really exciting. We think in every one of these cases, they've done something very special. But there's another class of emerging use cases that operate at massive scale. And these are new. These are happening, but they're still emerging. And they're made possible by the computation scale of Google Cloud Platform. You're here for a reason, because of Google Cloud. And I want to tell you that when you think about maps, Google Cloud is a great pair. And here are a few examples of, of why we think that is so. So a prime example here of this really magical powerhouse pairing of Google Cloud and Google Maps is a product called Earth Engine. This was developed at Google. And what we did here was we turned Google Cloud's enormous computing horsepower on this rich world of geo data sets that we have. And what we were able to do was to enable insights at unprecedented speeds. Now, the first application of Earth Engine 
was not commercial. It was actually about mapping the forests of the earth. Which is sort of, it's a beautiful thing because ultimately, if this is about the earth, our trees are an incredible national resource and having knowledge and access and understanding how, they, how, how our um, forest ecosystem is doing is actually a really important part of our mission as well. But there had never been previously a way to systematically map changes in the earth, map it to forest areas at a high resolution. And that's what we did. We partnered with Google Forest Watch and Professor Hansen for and created the world's first high resolution global forest change map. So those of you, I hope you were able to see that this map got success, successively pinker as I was speaking. That was basically what, what you could see happen in that very few seconds was really a, um, a recording of the changes in deforestation within the US. So the more pink you see, the worse the news is. Um, and what we're also able to do is not only track the status of these forest losses, we can also provide alerts on when there are recent forest losses so we can keep this updated. Now, to create this global forest map, we had to process, this was not trivial, we had to process 650,000 images across 10,000 cloud-based servers in parallel. Now, this would take a single computer 15 years. That's even well before the time we created Google Maps. And we were able to do this with Earth Engine in just a few days. Now, if we could only figure out how to regrow those trees that fast, but that's, these are some of the examples you can see of just the power with cloud and maps and the, the applications that can be uh, provided. Uh, something we tried at Google, but we also have another example here. And this one's very different. So I'm taking you from the forest to the world of Pokestops. So here we have Niantic and Pokemon Go. Who here hasn't played Pokemon Go? Um, wow, <laughs> okay. We should, um, I should, I should help you download the app as you leave. Um, it was, I'm not a gamer, but I spent, I would say at least a week last summer um, playing the game and really discovering my neighborhood. I had not walked many of these streets. So it was a, a very unusual, a very innovative experience, a completely new gaming experience that starts to give you glimpses of the world we see in the future of augmented reality experiences. And what they did was they basically leveraged a custom version of our Maps API, among other sources, to create this gaming experience, which is great. We loved it. But there was another really interesting angle here. In addition to creating this really unique gaming experience, they found themselves, as could be evidenced in just the, the number of hands in this room, there were only two. So you could imagine if this is some, if we extrapolate this around the world, they found themselves caught up in this unexpected, explosive growth. Now, growth is always a good thing for a company. 2x, 3x, you think you can handle. They went up to 50x in that first week. That's meltdown time. But in this case, both Niantic and the engineers from Google Cloud were able to work together and help them scale. Now, this is just the beginning. As I said, this is the first glimpse of what we believe is really going to be some of the experiences we see more of in the future, where companies start to create these augmented reality experiences where they merge the, the world with other um, artifacts and create these really incredible augmented reality experiences. I hope these two examples gave you a sense, a glimpse of just the power and the capabilities when you pair rich real world data from maps with the computing power and scale of GCP. So going back again a little bit to our journey, because we found that every time we go, we, we rewind and look at sort of where we are, we found, as I said, we kept finding ourselves hitting roadblocks. So in the early days, in order to create the, digi the digital map for Google Maps, we had a team of engineers, not thousands. Um, Google always runs really lean. Um, we had a sizable team 
of programmers that were building these applications with hand-coded hand rules. And this was fine. This was great. It was working until it wasn't. As we started to build richer experiences and we raised the bar on what it meant to be a map, it was not just a digital version of a paper map. It was a map that had to live and breathe. It had to be in real time. We wanted rich experiences that could even give you some prediction about the future. We, ran, we found ourselves in a position where our old development strategies just wouldn't scale. It, we, we couldn't have gone from 100 to 1,000. We would have had to have tens of thousands of engineers to do that, to basically meet the demands of our dreams. So that's when we turned to machine learning. With machine learning, we essentially gave computers the ability to learn from the data and make predictions on the data. So a great example of machine learning on Google Maps is, um, is a feature we launched very recently called Popular Times. So here, we're able to give you an indication for any place that you want to visit, what might be the popular times or the less busy times, so you can decide you know, how you want to schedule your visit. And we did this with machine learning. Another great example um, is the, the map you see on the right. So here are the reds indicate high traffic, and the greens are, you know, greens are um, roads that don't have much traffic. Now, our machine learning models predicted these traffic delays in Wyoming based on weather changes ahead of us even getting the data feeds. So we knew what was going to happen. Not we, our machine learning models knew. And this notion of having predictive, real-time experiences just simply would not have been possible if we hadn't invested in machine learning. So with machine learning, and I think there are many, many talks here uh, over the next coming days, I would really ask you to go spend some time there, because this is fundamentally going to change the way we think about almost everything. But back to our case, what we have found is we can use the signals from connected devices, from real-time maps, and location data, and answer new questions and make really powerful predictions about the real world. But what is equally exciting is that this deep knowledge that we have now, this understanding of location and machine learning and cloud computing, we now have the potential to help you, enterprises, build these smart assistive solutions that we've been trying to release on our own Google services. So here's a great example. It's a really powerful example. It's also a deeply humbling example. Um, so I'm going to take you from the forests now to, to the oceans. The health of our planet's oceans, I think you all know, are under threat from global overfishing. And what's great, though, is some of these smart assistive solutions that I was talking about are now being used to monitor, prevent, and address these situations. So here's how this is happening in this particular case. There are about 200,000 vessels around the world, shipping vessels, that broadcast their location, their course, their speed, back to satellites up in the skies, fleets of satellites that record these streams, and then transmit the, the information back to Earth. Now, we took this information in partnership with the Global Fishing Watch organization, and using Google's cloud computing and our machine learning models, we were able to pinpoint which of the vessels there were fishing vessels, when and where they were fishing, and also be able to make an assessment of whether there was overfishing happening in regions of the planet. Now, this is the first of its kind. This has never previously been done before. This computation at this scale with billions of data points and making these sorts of inferences on where we believe overfishing is happening could not have happened without the power of maps cloud and machine learning. So taking this back, I said at the start, we think location intelligence, this combination is of maps, cloud, and machine learning is a force multiplier. In this case, we really think it's, it's, it's been proven to be a force for good. So in case you've forgotten, <laughs> 
This is the magic combination. Allstate, Lyft, DPD, Tripping, Earth Engine, Global Fishing Watch, Pokemon Go. I think that's it. None of these solutions would have been possible when we began our journey 11 years ago. We didn't. I'd love to say we actually had this great plan and we saw all this coming. We didn't because all these experiences and all these great examples that you've heard of were made by businesses like yours. Our customers have made incredible strides, even as we've been making our journey with Google Maps and Search and, um, and Earth Engine, and in many, many cases, well beyond our imaginings. So they really push the envelope on us, and that's actually what gets us excited, because then that's a problem that our engineers are excited to solve. What we found now is the problems are becoming exponentially more challenging. A few years ago, customers would come to us and say, I'd love to get a map on my website. Help me visualize the world. Help me provide custom data on a map. And these are all really good use cases. But now the problems have become a lot more sophisticated. Now it's around help me plan, provide me insights, tell me what's moving, who's moving, what can you give me predictions on where they're going to go next or what's going to happen in the world next from visualization to making these major business decisions, at the center of it all is location intelligence. This is, I said at the beginning, and we truly believe because this is what we're hearing from our customers and this is what we're starting to see. There is this incredible momentum now for location intelligence. There is, I'll leave you with the final point, and actually, I think I left the most important point till the end. When I started out saying, and, and actually the topic here is location intelligence is a force multiplier, a force multiplier needs something to act on, right? I mean, otherwise it's gonna multiply in a vacuum. And that something really is you. It's your ideas, it's your initiative. You have the tools and the talent, and the most important of all, and this is something we've realized over and over again, you know the customer. You know the customer better than we do. And when you put that together, that's when something really special happens. Now, I've given you a few examples, but I think it's always more powerful when it comes from some of our partners. So I'm going to now um, leave the stage and pass it to two of our partners, Sada and Vagabond, who can share with you their experiences as they went through this journey towards building great businesses and experiences with location intelligence. To start with, I'm going to welcome Patrick, who is the head of cloud and geospatial technology at Sada Systems. Thank you. Welcome. What I want to talk to you all about today is this idea of cloud and maps, right? How do you incorporate cloud and maps past an idea? How do you bring it to a company and actually impact that company? So before I talk about each one of these bubbles, so to speak, I want to talk a little bit about the use case of a company we work with, AAA. I'm sure all of you have heard of AAA, unless those that were playing don't play Pokemon Go also don't use AAA, I don't know. <laughs> the point here is AAA is a long-standing company, right? They've been in business for a while. They have a widely adopted business model that's made them successful. So how do you take that long-standing business model and that ideology that's made this company so successful and convince them that you can grow it, right? How do you increase efficiency of an already created business model? And so what we did, we being Sada Systems and Google, we sat down with AAA's core team responsible for the customer success of their roadside assistance. And so customer success in this, in this instance pertains not just to you as the end user as, with a flat tire, what have you, but also their operating team, right? So what are their operating team members doing today on their roadside assistance platform? And so one of the things that we really focused on was understanding and identifying every single aspect that they're using today with AAA's roadside assistance. So what that means is 
not just the system, but the actual end users, right? So those end users that are being impacted by the system itself. And so we basically built out interviews in what we call a gap analysis model. And that's really what curated building this relationship with AAA, right? How do you bring cloud and Google Maps and this idea of those two things to truly benefit and impact a business? No less a business that's been, as I mentioned before, long-standing, right? How do you breach and get over that obstacle, so to speak? And so that really brings me to these points, right? So I, I talked about building this relationship. We'll get into how we really carried out the methodology of problem solving. And then the overall solution we provided. So for the tech heads in here, um, it's going to get a little technical as it pertains to what we built. But I'll keep it business conceptual. Uh, the next piece is the relationship with Google, right? So why is it that SADA was able to build this model? Why couldn't AAA just do this themselves? They have Google, they can go Google things themselves. So what unique qualities does SADA and Google working together give to a company like AAA? And then the last piece in the obvious is the benefits. Great. So really these four core things in terms of building this relationship. And so if you look at our business model, Google's business model, there's two aspects of outreach, right? There's this digital sense of outreach where you look up Google Maps, you can identify and understand Google Maps APIs, Google Cloud. But then there's a second form of outreach, and that's more on the sales rep side. And we really want to get consultative and expand that knowledge base of Google Maps and Cloud, trying to understand and identify how, the, how what you read online impacts you as a business, right? And really trying to take that narrative to the next level and core, in this instance, to what AAA does on a day-by-day -day basis. And so that involves our team, our sales team, our engineering team, Google's sales team, Google's engineering team, to really sit and make these things unique and specific to AAA. And that, in, obvious, in an obvious sense, brings a great customer response, right? It's one thing if I myself go online, and I'm AAA in this instance, I go online and look up you know, all these different aspects of Maps API, but what do I do with it, right? And so that's where Google and SADA come in and go through Exactly what I just mentioned before, that narrative itself. And then you have this, this approach, this overall unique aspect of an approach. And really what you'll see um, in a few slides here is what we built. But it truly is a unique experience with AAA. We built a custom web service using Google Maps APIs and Google Cloud Platform that essentially gives them a data repository specific and unique to AAA's roadside assistance team. So the solution that we really built for AAA, right? what's the breakdown in the architecture of the system itself? So what we're looking at here is AAA in the obvious, and then these different components of Google Cloud Platform, Google Maps APIs, and Street View. So how are these three things used within AAA's ecosystem? And what we did was we used the data output of Google Maps API. So that includes geocoding, point of interest data, so places API, as well as the obvious, which is just the core base map itself. Now, the reason this is so important is that when we were going through that interview process that I mentioned previously with those customers being the operators, they, in fact, were using the public version of Google Maps in addition to their previous platform. And what I mean by that is their previous platform, for example, didn't have Street View. So they, in fact, would get a customer call or somebody has a you know, broken down car, for example, and I say, I'm on this intersection and I'm right across from the Taco Bell. What their actual, the AAA member would do is they would go outside of their application, pull up Street View on the public version of Google Maps and identify exactly where that Taco Bell is, right? So this is an obvious inefficiency where we're taking the power of Google from an enterprise perspective, right? This is an instance where you're using Street View to identify where an actual customer's location is. And I'll talk about the benefits of that in just a moment. But really, this is the core concept of leveraging the different aspects of Google and how we've built a custom workflow for AAA. So we essentially, with Google, built a complete custom web service that takes into account routing. So they actually use our tool for um, vehicle rerouting. So we'll take into account vehicle type and then suggest the appropriate route. And then that gets pushed into their actual system. And so we use Cloud SQL to match the schema associated with you know, their current database. 
And in the end, what you're really driving at is an end user experience. So not only did we give them a RESTful web service, but we actually gave them a unique user experience. And so really what you're looking at here is my ability as a AAA roadside assistance member to use Google Maps, the tool that I'm already familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis in my personal lifestyle on an enterprise side. In addition to that, I'm using the power of Google Cloud Platform to generate this massive web service created by SADA and partnering with Google. So this concept of working with Google, um, so we're talking about product insight, advanced access, Google's design development. So what does all this mean, right? And so our company, SADA, um, has really gone through a cultural shift. We're focused on hiring the core developers. So we, in the past, we're, we were seen as a, a consultant, right? We're now going towards that shift of being an engineering company first. 10 engineers for every single sales rep, right? That's, that's our goal. And the reason behind that is we're really taking a lot of the adopted methodologies of Google. Building a core product that can represent itself or building a core competency and services that can represent itself above and beyond what any sales rep can come in and talk about. That's core to what we're trying to do here. And that's really what's driven us to the partner of the year, right? So over the past few years, we've been recognized globally, um, although not this year, by Google for this work, right? So that's just one instance. AAA is just one use case where we're driving at that type of relationship and how it can impact businesses such as AAA. So the last piece I'll talk about is the actual benefits here, right? So you have user adoption and utilization. And so utilization is core to someone like me. If you look at other products, anything, could be Microsoft Word, right? Do people use 100% of Microsoft Word? And so that's another focus that we had, not only giving them Google Maps, but focusing on do they use 100% or close to 100% of the application, right? And that's one of the things that we, come, we have come to find is significant growth versus what they were previous, their previous system. So in their previous system, you had certain users using 10% as super users, other people not even using it, using the public version of Google Maps to get to a specified location. Then we get into increased efficiency on calls. Right? So having more accurate data, the ability to go to Street View, all of these different aspects of a revised tool, in the obvious, relays itself to increased efficiency. Then we talk about increased accuracy. So Google, as it pertains to updating its geocoding, right? if, you, if you really look at what is core to Google Maps, it's people. And people are really what's built it out. Right? It's a massive system, massive ecosystem, extremely complex from an infrastructure level. But people are responsible for the accuracy in terms of updating locations. I just, you know, just moved into a home. It's not showing up on Google. Or I just opened up a new store. It's not showing up on Google. All of this is core to building out that accuracy and being taken advantage of, again, at an enterprise level. And then the last piece is a pretty obvious one, which is CSAT, or customer satisfaction, across the board. So not only are we increasing efficiency as it pertains to an individual truck driver getting to you all faster when you get a flat tire, but we're also increasing the efficiency of the actual operator, right? And so across the board, we've completed true customer satisfaction. So in conclusion, just to kind of bring this full circle, we're talking about how Google Maps and Google Cloud Platform directly integrated with a system that was built to match the unique aspects of a long-standing business has, has helped them change the way that they internally map out which route to take in accordance to which customer, and really building out an end user experience for their version of an end user, above and beyond the actual cust you all, the customer, but their operating team. And so that's really what the power of Google Cloud Platform and Google Maps gave to AAA. So with that all said, I'm now going to be introducing uh, Michael from Vagabond Vending to talk a little bit about everything that they're using Google Maps API for. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, guys. Who wants to talk about vending machines? <laughs> Concept that's near and dear to everybody's heart, right? So thanks for uh, spending the next 10 or so minutes uh, just exploring this topic with me. Let's see a show of hands. How many in the room have visited a vending machine in the last year or so? 
Don't be shy, I know most of you have. Almost all of you, okay, that's good. So please keep your hands up if that experience has in some way or another been, let's say, subpar. Many, many of you, okay. So that's the problem we're solving. So thanks very much, Patrick, and thank you, Gaia3, for inviting me to share the stage with you today. Thanks also to Google and to our uh, integration partner, Woolpert, for an excellent partnership and a powerful partnership over the past couple years. My name is Michael. I'm in from DC, Washington, DC, where I live with my lovely wife in an apartment with a door that constantly revolves with friends and family. And that's how we like to keep it. That's our top priority in life, my wife and I, is to have the time and the money to do what we want to do with our friends and family. Five years ago, I founded a technology company based on the premise of returning the same to small business owners in America. The core premise or the core mission of Vagabond's team is to improve the quality of life of our customers, small business owners, in this case, in the vending industry. The small ones want time back in their life. The big ones want better processes so we can drive more profits to the bottom line. And all the stakeholders in, in, in between, whether they're counting coins, or they're working in the warehouse, or they're out on the roads, want some sort of uh, purpose and fulfillment in their jobs. And they also want a, a way to participate in the bottom line. And that's what the Vagabond team comes into work every day to deliver to the stakeholders in vending businesses. Luckily for all of us involved, there's an enormous financial incentive. It's a $20 billion market in the US alone. Can you believe it? $20 billion bills flow through 6 million vending machines operated by 8,000 family businesses in America alone. So this is another way to look at it is this is nearly 20 billion individual retail buying decisions. So later on in the presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some new products that Vagabond is releasing that rely heavily on Google's infrastructure that help us link the people who are buying things with the people who are selling things and the people who make things. But before I do, I want to tell you a little bit of a backstory about how Google and Woolpert and Vagabond got together to turn the industry on its head. So our customers own and operate between one and a few thousand of these vending machines between North and Central America. For the last five years, we've been operating an IoT, or machine-to-machine -machine communications network, bringing live sales and machine data back from the field that sources mobile and web products that our customers use and their teams use throughout the day to make better decisions. Imagine if you owned 1,000 vending machines between here, downtown San Francisco, to uh, San Jose, and maybe Oakland, right? Before Vagabond, you got a lot of problems. On these roads, it's a nightmare. Must be. So our operators are using Vagabond in order to figure out where to go, exactly what products to bring, in order to bring those machines back to capacity, what products are selling best, exactly how to get there, of course, who's stealing from them, and otherwise financially administrate their business. So operators, in doing so, can expect for their net profit margins to triple to quadruple because their revenues are higher because we're stocking the right products, their costs are lower because we're simply accomplishing more with less guys driving less trucks, fewer miles, and their theft is eliminated. In a $20 billion industry in the US, 80% of that is, conducted, is still conducted in cash, if you can believe that. And 15% of that cash gets stolen before it gets back to the warehouse. So that's a $2 billion problem. So before Vagabond, you've got problems. And they're pretty easy to see. So I want to tell you a little bit about how Google and Wolpert helped us solve them. So you've got 1,000 machines, and we need to know where they are. You guys would be amazed to know how many customers present themselves to us without knowing exactly how many vending machines they have. These are $5,000 assets. They don't know how many they have, much less where they are. So we've got to know where they are. So Wolpert helped us put together some facilities that allows the operators to uh, geolocate um, the machines and actually drag and drop precise locations 
through Google's geocoding APIs. OK, so now we can drop a machine in the cafeteria in the, in the front of a building, and another one in the loading dock in the back, which is serviced by a different entrance. So you can see how that can make an impact when you're trying to get to 50 machines in a day. And we've got to make it easy for them to onboard, and us to onboard, the customer. I won't bore you with the dozens and dozens of, of data points that we need for each of your 1,000 machines in order to onboard into our ERP system. But making it easy to actually plot the machine, establish an address, and pinpoint an exact location through geocoding and places APIs is an, ex is an, is a, is an incredible enhancement to the onboarding process. So once we have the machines plotted on the map, our ERP tools and our IoT systems are able to lay layer real-time information directly onto the pinpoints on the map so that users or operators, route managers, can make each truck's schedule for the day. And they can filter those endpoints by the route, whose route is it, the geography of the machines, how much cash is sitting there waiting for them in the machine, how full the machine is, and whether or not the machine needs other kind of service. Now, this relies heavily on Google's JavaScript's API. <clears throat> and once the route is set, our route operators can use the directions API to make sure that truck's route is going to be optimal for the day. From there, we can, the warehouse can load the truck with exactly what products they're going to need to bring all those machines up to capacity, and they're off on their way. So you can already sort of see just by laying real, layering real-time data over top of Google's mapping products, how much impact you can have on a small to medium uh, business in America. But you've still got problems. So in order to provide this service to vending operators, we need to be able to connect the machines. And really, the, right, the only right way to do it is to connect all the machines. Right? Historically, we've been able to do this primarily through third-party credit card readers. The problem with that is that they're just way too expensive. They're so expensive, in fact, uh, to run on a remote automated retail location that only about 20% of the vending machines, the 6 million vending machines in the country, are ever going to generate enough money, enough revenue, to warrant the cost of a credit card reader. The hardware is too expensive. The data fees are too expensive. The transaction fees for micropayments are through the roof. But Consumers are starting to uh, more and more demand flexible payment options. I mean, honestly, who carries cash anymore? So I want to introduce to you, for the first time, Vive, a revolutionary new payment service that allows consumers to buy from machines and pay any way you like. These are instant mobile transactions that don't require you to touch the machine, these are real, live e-commerce transactions occurring 100% in the cloud, but delivering you product in real life right in front of your eyes. Now, in addition to providing us and our operators a really inexpensive way to connect the machines to our ERP servers so that we can provide them all sorts of great operational benefits, Vive lets us create relationships directly with, between buyers and sellers, between consumers, and operators. And it also helps brands deliver value directly to consumers. And as you can imagine, we're driving a lot of the smarts through Google's engines. So just open the app, scroll through the menu of items, select your product, view nutritional information, loyalty offerings, promotional details, Choose your payment option, and the product drops. No touching the machine, no NFC connection, no point of sale hardware, and no teller. So I know that what you're thinking right now, most of you in the audience are thinking, well, it's about freaking time, Michael, that I can do this at a vending machine. Like, come on. OK, but I can assure you that this is a technological feat of magic in the, in the world of vending machines. We're talking about an industry, we're talking about releasing this technology to an industry who counts the acceptance of a dollar bill as one of their great innovations in the last 40 years. <laughs> so how does it work? So each time we install a piece of IoT gear 
It calls home using Google's geolocation APIs, and it gives us the approximate location. Now, remember that operators are using our ERP systems to apply a, an exact geocode of where that machine actually is. We're also, in this case, constantly able to geolocate Vive users that are walking around the machines. They're walking around the block. We're using Bluetooth, or BLE, to sort of solve the last puzzle piece of the equation between the location of the machine and the location of the user. We're using it to improve the location accuracy, all these things placed together. We're using it to determine the orientation of machines in a machine bank. So oftentimes, there's three or four machines in the same place. And of course, we're using Bluetooth to also deliver uh, the service to consumers. From there, we're driving payments directly through Android Pay, all brought to you through a combination of Vagabond's ERP, Woolpert Engineering, Google Maps API, and the Vive consumer platform. So with powerful tools from Google, Vagabond has been able, and support from Woolpert, excuse me, Vagabond has been able to re revolutionize the consumer buying experience with the Vive consumer platform. We have the technology today to deliver massive profits back to small businesses in America. And now we can create direct relationships between buyers, sellers, and makers of goods in real time at the point of sale directly at the purchase. All of this put together enables us to expand the footprint of Google's already very powerful advertising platform directly into the consumer experience and through the power of location-based services and the Internet of Things. So thank you very much for your time.